bright duty every student matters students welcome to another lecture in this class we are going to continue with the unit 8 of class 12 education nagal and four which is learning now in the past videos we talked about the meaning of learning what are the characteristics of learning what were the theories that were introduced by we have learned about um, the conditional uh, you know the theory of thondike the trial and error theory by thondike as well as the classical conditioning theory by pavlov its implications in education its evaluation its features and also something about these very famous psychologists now in this video i'm going to record i'm going to talk to you about bf skinner's operant conditioning theory this is the third learning theory that we shall be discussing now first let us talk about this psychologist so verhus frederick skinner bf skinner for short was born on the may 20 march 28th 1904 and died august 18 1990 and he was known as b f skinner as i told you he was an american psychologist he was a behaviorist he was an author inventor as well as a social philosopher now he was the edgar peirce professor for psychology at the harvard university from 1958 to 1974 Skinner always focused on illusion and the fact that human action is dependent on something that they've done previously so what they did previously its consequences impact the current actions of the human beings he believed that if the consequences if what we did in the past if its results were bad then there are chances for us to do something bad in the future as well and if the consequences the result of it was good then obviously our actions ought to be better in our future and this was known as the principle of reinforcement now reinforcement again is something that we've talked about in the classical conditioning theory as well so skinner also believed in it according to him in order to strengthen in order to make your behavior strong he used the operant conditioning and he considered that after the operant conditioning the rate of response that you got was more effective and the response for was better as compared to earlier so prior to operant conditioning and post operant conditioning he believed that the response the quality of response was better in order to study the theory of operant conditioning he invented uh, you know an operant conditioning chamber just like we've seen uh, you know pavlov also talk about his classical conditioning theory with the help of that box in which he talked about a bell and a dog salivating and then thondike also talked about his trial and error theory with the help of a cat who was there in a closed box with fish outside similarly b f skinner validated his theory of um, you know operant conditioning with the help of an operant conditioning chamber which was also known as the skinner box and to measure the rate he invented the cumulative recorder so he not only invented the skinner box in order to authenticate his theory but to measure the rate at which one is going to answer is going to respond he invented a cumulative recorder as well so using these tools obviously he came up with his experiment and the experiment that he came up with was published in the book schedules of the enforcement in 1957 now skinner focused on developing the behavior analysis of people 
he wished to analyze the changes in the behavioral pattern and the reasons that influenced those changes the philosophy of the science you know which is known as the radical behaviorism the changes that will take place in your behavior owing to some factors is known as radical behaviorism and he founded an experimental research and he obviously as i told you his theory focused on analyzing one's behavior now this theory this learning that he came up with he aimed at helping the people and his book uh, one of the books verbal behavior considered skinner to be a prolific author he wrote this book as well and then along with this he published 21 books in total and uh, 180 articles so as i told you in the beginning not only was he a psychologist but also an author apart from that skinner was a pioneer was the master of modern behaviorism along with john d watson and ivan pavlov now in 2002 june survey skinner was listed as one of the most influential psychologists of the 20th century p s skinner is concerned with the behavior that can be observed the outward behavior of the people and according to him learning is something which is a chance you know in the probability of response so if you learn the probability of you giving the right response is going to get better this is what he believed in now let us now discuss the terms that skinner used in his theory and let us understand their meanings okay the first term or rather let me just show you first the skinner's box and then we are going to move towards the terminology that he introduced yes so this was the skinner's box as you can see there is now a rat in this box there is a food cup which is placed in front of it you know the dispenser the pellet dispenser through which the food is going to be dropped and will go to the cup then there is an electric grid there is a shock generator speaker signal lights and the lever clicking which the food is going to be dispensed so this was the entire structure of the skinner's box we are obviously going to learn about this structure we are obviously going to learn about this experiment but before that let us look at the terms used by skinner so the first one is operant conditioning what does this mean it is that learning process which makes a response more probable you know or if i say that if you offer better and more frequent rewards to somebody the possibility for you to get the correct response is going to be higher this is what operant conditioning stated this helped in the learning of learning the behavior of the organism or the thing who is in study this behavior is not necessarily associated with a known stimuli you know it is not important that there always has to be some food let's say which is to be given to the animal and only then that animal is going to react no it talks about responses which can be increased which can be made possible if the person learns how to operate something well if i know how to use the lever let's say what is lying outside my box will not matter okay the second term that we are going to learn about is an operant so operant is basically the set of acts which the organism does raising your head walking pushing clawing pouring you know what all things the organism inside the skinner's box or an organism in picture 
whatever actions that organism will do, those uh, actions are known as operands. So, operand conditioning is that process and the actions which the person or the organism does who is in experiment, it is going to be known as operand. Then we have reinforce. Reinforce means those stimuluses, you know, uh, those stimulus which help in increasing the possibility of getting a good response. Something which is offered so that you can expect to get a better response at the end of it. So that stimulus which is offered to get a good response is the reinforce. According to Skinner, there are two types of reinforce, positive as well as negative. What is positive reinforce? Something which increases the possibility for the occurrence to get better, okay, which leads to an improvement in the possibility of something happening. For example, offering food, water, shelter, luxury, these are all positive reinforcers. Because if I know that if I work hard, I'm going to get better food, I'm going to get a better home for myself, this is going to give me the motivation to keep on striving ahead. On the other hand, negative reinforce is that which ought to be removed, you know, the occurrence of which is going to help you retreat back. If a negative reinforce happens, you will never do that task again. Burning your finger, getting an electric shock, a loud noise, screeching of the brakes. All these are the negative uh, reinforcers because obviously these are negative reinforcers as the name suggests. They are negative in nature. You can expect a task to be completed only when these reinforcers are removed. For example, if I am cleaning, let's say, a TV unit and the possibility for me to get an electric shock is high, I am obviously going to be in dread of it. I am going to be scared of doing that and will also prevent myself from cleaning it as much as I can. So, if somebody wants me to clean the, uh, the television unit, he or she will have to ensure that that negative reinforce, that means the electric short component of uh, the TV unit has to be removed. Only then would I be able to clean it. So, positive reinforce is that the presence of which motivates you to do some task better. And negative reinforce is that which has to be removed if you want the task to be completed. Okay. Next is reinforcement. Now reinforcement is that technique wherein a reinforce is repeated regularly so that the chances of the completion of an act become more probable. It is, more, it is possible for you to get an outcome at the end. So, reinforcement is anything that is going to make your response better, that is going to ensure that you are learning better. Again, as I said, a positive reinforcement means just the way a teacher offers rewards to the students gives a chocolate when the student gives a correct answer or let's say a candy on the same. This is a positive reinforcement technique because doing this, the child is going to be motivated to learn in every class so that he or she is able to answer. On the other hand, negative reinforcement like punishing the child, beating the child, you know, talking loudly to the child. These are negative reinforcement techniques. They need to be withdrawn if the teacher wants the student to be a better learner. So, this is what reinforcement is. Next is partial reinforcement. As the name suggests, partial reinforcement. That means those reinforcement techniques which are not fully, uh, you know, reliable. 
and following which will not mean that completely you will be able to achieve what you want the possibility for one to achieve something with the help of partial reinforcement is less than 100% then we have the respondent behavior now who is a respondent respondent is obviously the person or uh, you know if i say in terms of psychology the response which is elicited by the known stimuli is known as the respondent behavior for example if we move back to the classical conditioning theory by pavlov respondent was my dog and how did the dog respond when the bell was rung along with the food he salivated so this was the respondent behavior on production of the food if let's see my eyes they are the respondents and the moment i expose my eyes to bright sunlight what will happen my eyes will automatically shut they will contract this is the behavior that the respondent is going to display when some external force is applied and what is the operant behavior operant behavior means the response which is emitted by the unknown stimuli you know and stimuli is that known as the operant behavior so the unknown stimuli what does that unknown stimuli do is known as the operant behavior for example something which excuse me is done by you voluntarily i come across let's say again bright sunlight i want to protect my eyes from that what is the first thing that you people do when you go into the sun this right immediately our hands are going to move so that they can be covered from the sun rays yes if there is a loud noise that can be heard and in the same room there is a baby sleeping what is going to be your immediate response your finger is going to go to your lips this is your operant behavior so something which involves the movement of one's hand legs fingers etc and so on. the next term okay this was the skinner's box as i have already told you the next term that we shall discuss about is the schedule of reinforcement now what do we mean by schedule of reinforcement now according to skinner the idea of planning the schedules of when and how the reinforcement theory will work this was very important for example let's say if a teacher wants to elicit wants to get a better response and a better result from the learners the teacher will have to decide and will have to schedule her reinforcement technique every day the teacher cannot continue to distribute candies or chocolates to the students there has to be a rate at which when it is to be done there might be a few who would want to do it regularly there would there would be a few who would want to do it let's say every alternate day there would be a few who would want to do it once a week so this schedule needs to be sent a uh, set prior to planning your reinforcement check and we are going to discuss and learn about such schedules the first one is continuous reinforcement schedule as the name suggests this schedule is when a reward or a praise or you know a good word is given to a learner regularly for every correct answer the child gives he is going to get a candy if the child gives 100 correct answers a day he get 100 candies if he gives 200 correct answers a day he get 200 candies so this is in continuity for every correct response the person is going to get a reward right this can be in terms of negative reinforcement also for every incorrect response the person is going to get a scolding so if the person if a child gives an incorrect response 100 times he is going to be scolded 100 times as well 
So, with every correct or incorrect response, whatever reinforcement follows is continuous reinforcement. Then we have fixed level interval reinforcement schedule. As the name suggests, the interval at which the reinforcement technique will be followed is fixed. Let's say every three days, every five minutes, every one class. So these are the fixed interval reinforcement schedules. Let's say again, if we talk about the child. If a child is giving the correct answer, he is going to be rewarded, let's say, after 10 minutes. So, he gave an answer first, the correct answer, he got a candy for that. Now, the teacher has fixed already that the next reward will be given after 10 minutes. So, in between those 10 minutes, if the child gives any correct response, he or she will not be rewarded for that. So, there is a fixed period of time which is decided for the reinforcement to follow. Then we have variable interval reinforcement schedule. Again, as the name suggests, variable is the opposite of fixed. Fixed was when it was decided when it will be repeated. After 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 1 day, 2 days, 3 days, it was pre-decided. Variable reinforcement is when the response or rather the uh, you know the reinforcement schedule is not fixed but it can vary and the variation again depends for example let's say if a child okay has her birthday today since it is a special day for this girl the teacher has decided that for every correct answer that the girl will get, she is going to receive a hand. Okay. Now, but tomorrow, obviously, since the birthday is going to be over, so the entire technique is going to just change and the teacher is not going to repeat the same thing tomorrow. So, the reinforcement technique varies from day to day or from person to person. Okay. There has to be some average time and you know the teacher can probably think about some special days like what I mentioned in order to reward the children. Then we have the fixed, okay, the fixed ratio reinforcement schedule. Fixed ratio reinforcement schedule. This means that a person or a child is going to be given a reward only after a fixed number of responses. I am conducting a quiz in the class. I will reward the person only after he or she has given me five correct answers. The moment a child reaches the score of five, he or she receives a chocolate. So, this is the fixed ratio reinforcement schedule where I have decided, where I have fixed the ratio that after these many correct responses, I am going to award the child with a chocolate. This was fixed ratio reinforcement. And next we have the variable ratio reinforcement. Again, variable ratio reinforcement means that schedule or when the re re reinforcement or reward is given at varying intervals of time or after a varying number of responses. The, the child would never know when he or she is going to be rewarded. Right now, the teacher is giving you a reward for two correct responses. The teacher might next give you a response after seven correct responses, then after 15 correct responses and so on and so forth. So, here the number of responses that the teacher expects out of you gets on increasing gradually and the child, the person is always, uh, you know, confused and that is how he's always motivated to give correct answers every time because he does not know for what correct answer I might get a reward. So, these were the terms that were introduced by Skinner. Now let us, okay, 
Now let us talk about what Skinner feels about these intervals of the schedule. You know, why did Skinner introduce these reinforcement schedules? Because he believes that if there is a proper schedule for the reinforcement technique, the learning that you can get from the student, from a learner can be improved. In every case, if it is a continuous reinforcement, the child will know that for every correct answer, I am going to get a candy. So, he will try to give a correct answer every time. If it is fixed, he again knows that I have given the first answer now. Now, after 10 minutes, I am going to give get the candy. So, I will have to continue giving the correct answers for the next 10 minutes so that I can receive a candy. The last one that we discussed about the variable, uh, you know, reinforcement schedule, the variable ratio reinforcement schedule, for example, will keep the child glued in the class because he will not know for what answer he can expect to be given a candy. So, this is how reinforcement techniques and schedules are going to motivate the children to give an answer all the time. Now, let us discuss about the experiment, the Skinner's box that we talked about. Skinner experimented with rats. We have seen that already. And he designed the Skinner's box. Now, what was the Skinner's box? Hmm. The Skinner's box was dark. It was soundproof. There was no sound inside the Skinner's box. There was a system of light or a sound. So, light and sound will be produced only when the food was delivered through the palate. I showed you there was a palate through which the food will be delivered and would transfer to the food pan. Right? So, when the food was going to be delivered, there is going to be a sound and a light. Now, near the food pan, there was a liver. We all saw that. The liver was arranged in such a manner that when the hungry rat is going to press the liver, the feeder mechanism is going to get activated. A light will be there or a sound will be produced and that is when the food will be released. So first the rat is going to press the liver. There will be a sound or a light. Following that, there is going to be food coming through the pallet into the food pan. Now, in order to record the experiment, and what device did he use for recording? I told you, we discussed about that. Yes, so he used a cumulative recorder. Yes, so he recorded the entire uh, experiment with the help of a cumulative recorder. Now, in order to record the experiment, the liver in that Skinner box was connected with a recording system. And it was tracing how many times did the, uh, did the rat press the liver and for how much time the rat was in the box. So, what was the duration of the stay of rat inside the liver and how many times did we press the liver? Now, Skinner had placed a hungry rat in the box and in this experiment, he talked about the fact that the click sound or the production of some light meant that the food was there in that pallet. This is what that meant. The clicking sound or the signal was a cue, was an indication for the rat to go near to the food pan because he knew that he is going to be rewarded. So, every time the rat uh, hit the liver, there was a click sound, there was a signal, the food was delivered to the pan, the rat went near to it and was re re uh, rewarded for that. This procedure kept on increasing, this kept on repeating again and again. And in this way, the rat learned how to press the lever as the experimenter wanted him to. So, by offering him a reward at the end of it, the rat learned how to use the lever. 
Now, once, obviously, how did this operant conditioning work? What is the working of it? Now, we know the record of how many times did the rat press the liver, how, for how long was the rat inside the Skinner's box. And the experimenter was also able to teach the rat how to press the lever. So, the experimenter was able to get the response that he wanted by offering a suitable reinforce. The experimenter could help the rat learn the usage of the lever by offering him the food to the food balance. Now, with the passage of time, obviously, this response will get conditioned, obviously. Why? Because after every, uh, you know, meal, let's say, the rat who was hungry at first now has eaten, you know, is going to be probably less hungry and therefore the duration will now vary. First, the rat was pressing the liver for a longer number of time as compared to now when the cat is less hungry now. So, reinforcement when offered to somebody also depends on the duration for which it is offered to. Okay? And the secondary reinforcement may or may not produce the same result as the primary one. Because now the rat is very happy with the food that is being given to him. He might not be happy with a ball, let's say, that is offered to him. Or he may be even more happy. He is done with the food now. His hunger is satisfied. So, there is a possibility for him to learn to play. Right. So, Skinner believed that there was a need for neutral stimulus which acquire the reinforcement properties, you know. There are things which first did not matter at all. Food, for example, did not matter at all first. But when it was associated, uh, you know, with the reward that it was going to be given, Food for a rat, we all know rats can be found in every house and they can be seen in your sofas, your beds and every which way. So, when the reward was associated with a positive reinforce, that meant or that interested the rat more in the food that was offered to him. The clicking sound or the lightning were the secondary reinforcements. Because they indicated that now is the time for the food to be delivered to the rat. So the important fact about the operant conditioning is that one can get the desired response only when proper management has been made. Only when you offer a proper reinforcement to the person or the organism from which you want to get a good response, only then something can be expected out of it. The organism is going to respond to the reinforcement only if it is interest, it is of interest to him or her or it. And only then can you get the desired response. And with this response, what is taking place? Learning. The person is learning. Here the rat was learning how to press the lever. So this was the important aspect. This was the entire mechanism of the operant conditioning. Teaching the rat how to press the lever if it wanted. Okay.